Well, as Carl mentioned, uh, we we're blessed with another opportunity <coughs> to assemble together, worship together, and profit as God intends from our expressing our love and adoration for him. As you see the subject of the sermon this morning, before we get into that subject, I want to offer a disclaimer. The subject is not addressed today, this morning, because this church is celebrating an annual holy day. That's just not what we do. And there's good reason for that. The head of our church has not authorized us to do that. But there is good reason to address important doctrine. And unlike the birth of Jesus, the date of the resurrection is known. Scripture teaches that it occurred upon the first day of the week, what we would call Sunday, following the Passover observance of the Jews in 33 AD. So it is determined by the Jewish calendar. And it so happens that according to the Jewish calendar and the observance of the Passover, today is that day. But we're not observing the Jewish calendar either. But the, all that is to say, it's at this time of year, it's upon this day in particular, that a lot of people are thinking about the resurrection of Christ. And that's a good thing. <laughs> Um, and a lot of people are talking about the resurrection of Christ. I saw a recent poll taken and published. It indicated that 80%, 80 percent, 80, 80 percent of the people in this country believe that Christ was resurrected from the grave. I scratched my head. Is that really true? That's what it said. But what go on to say? Of those that express belief in the resurrection, less than half of them, when asked, will, it, will you attend church this Sunday? No. <laughs> so, so, see, belief in the resurrection does not get translated into an active belief in service to Christ, as it should. But all of that is to say, that our purpose this morning is to place emphasis upon not only the resurrection, but you see I have a word in this title that I've emphasized with italics and I will underline it. We're not only talking about the resurrection, I want us to think for just a few minutes about the bodily resurrection. You might be thinking, now, isn't that what we just think anyway? Well, we do, you may, but it's so important for your faith and my faith to be grounded as solidly as it can in the bodily resurrection of Christ. Not assuming, not taking for granted anything. And I want to show you why. Because in the religious world there are writings, there are books, there are teachings, there are things that are preached that say this. So the King Jesus, Christ Jesus, was put to death in the flesh, but was resurrected an invisible spirit creature. There are people in the religious world who believe that, who stand for that, who teach that, who will come to your door and try to teach you that. And you might say, well, do you believe in the resurrection? Sure, I believe in the resurrection. I do too. We must be on the same page. No, we're not. Because they believe in the resurrection only of a resurrection of an, what they call an invisible spirit creature. Well, that raises some questions, and maybe I can answer some of them with this next quote. And that is, Jehovah God disposed of the body in his own way, as he disposed of the body of Moses. Now, <laughs> when you think about that, I'm not taking this lightly, but, but, but personally, I can't believe that there are people 
of intelligence, of reasonable thinking ability who would believe. They have to have help to believe something else and they have a lot of it. But the point is we may ask what happened to the body then if it was not raised, if it wasn't a bodily resurrection then what happened to the body? <laughs> God disposed of it. But when you think about it, they liken this to God disposing of the body of Moses. God didn't dispose of the body of Moses. You read De Deuteronomy 31, and it says, while Moses died on Mount Nebo, God buried him. That's verse 6 or verse 7. And put him in a sepulcher on Mount Nebo. Now, that grave was not marked, the sepulcher. It is unknown. But to think that God just simply disposed of the body of Moses and had that as a basis, foundation, upon which the body of Jesus was treated. So your faith, my faith, needs to be solidly grounded in a bodily resurrection. That just simply means that what came out of that tomb was a body. <laughs> A physical body. What do you believe right now? Do you believe that? Eight out of ten people in this country do, and we trust that all of us here do. But what I want to spend a minute or two, a few minutes doing this morning, is showing us the basis of our faith. We don't just believe that blindly. We don't just accept that because somebody else said so. There are evidences, and that's what we're focusing our attention upon this morning. What evidences can we think of upon which your faith is built so that your faith is rock solid, immovable upon Scripture, upon what God said? And I urge you to make sure that's where your faith is. So what I'm going to do is to indicate on the chart some passages. I'm not going to have them written out on the screen. I invite you, if you will, to turn your Bible to these scriptures in order that we might read them together. The first evidence that you and I can come in contact with and come to know that is an evidence upon our faith which our faith can be based and built and strengthened and last forever <laughs> is Christ's own prophecy. As we turn our attention to John, the second chapter, there's a lot in this beginning of this chapter. We'll not read the entirety <laughs> of that beginning, but this is the first occasion of Jesus cleansing a temple and it was early in his ministry. This happened in the early stage of his ministry. He did this two or three more, two more times. But as we look at verse 13 and the occurrence of that, and Je the Jews saw Jesus running all of those animals out of the temple, whipping the animals, running them out, overturning the tables of the money changers. They came up to him and said, what sign do you have that you have authority to do this? Show us a sign. Who do you think you are is what they were saying. We don't think you, sh you have the authority to do this. Beginning in verse 18, if you have your Bible open, we will read the Jews therefore answered and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, saying that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Jesus answered their request, I'll show you a sign. You want a sign? I'll show you a sign. Destroy this temple, and I'll raise it up in three days. Well, of course, the Jews could not see past the, where they were, the physical structure of the temple. But Jesus, as you and I know, was using the word temple in a figurative sense. 
How do we know that? Let's read verse 20. The Jews therefore said, Forty and six years was this temple in building. Wilt thou raise it up in three days? That's, they're saying that's absurd, that's ridiculous. And what this does is record a statement of secular history because Herod the Great had been remodeling and rebuilding, refurbishing Solomon's temple there in Jerusalem. So it had been 46 years in the process during the earthly ministry of Jesus. And the Jews quoted that. You're not going to do in three days what has already been 46 years. <laughs> but John gives us an explanation in verse 21. But he spake of the temple of his body. It's that simple. By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle John knew what Jesus meant, and he wrote it for you and for me to explain what Jesus was talking about. He was speaking of the temple of his body. Now, what does that mean? What did he say? I will raise it up. Raise what up? Herod's temple? The Jewish temple? No. <laughs> my body. Now let's notice one more thing before we leave this evidence, and that is what is added by the Apostle John in verse 22. We would affirm, and you can believe, that what actually happened is what Jesus predicted. What he predicted is actually what happened, because it is stated in Scripture, and it produced faith. Verse 22, John, the second chapter. When therefore he was raised from the dead, John, John is writing the, this gospel about 96 AD, the end of the first century. So he's looking back on these things and said when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he spoke this and they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus has said. Now that's what you and I need to do. We need to do exactly what they did. <laughs> because it, it, it accomplished what Jesus intended then and it should not. Because they remembered that he spoke and you and I can read what he spoke and believe the scriptures and the word of Jesus. Now, for you and I to come along and say, we think we know better, we know more than this, we don't think he was bodily raised. Well, in other words, you're saying what Jesus said was wrong. What he predicted to happen did not happen. What he taught was false. You see, that's what has to be said. If Christ was not bodily resurrected from the tomb, that he was a false teacher expressing a false prophecy. But we know better because the scripture teaches us better. So one of the very strong evidences of the bodily resurrection is what Jesus himself predicted <laughs> himself and what he said would happen. Here's a second evidence, and that is the tomb itself where Jesus was buried becomes an evidence. Okay, let's see how that is so. I invite your attention to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16. Mark 16 is a very familiar and well-known chapter in Mark, but we're looking at the beginning of the chapter and not the Great Commission that occurs later. But here in Mark 16, beginning at verse 1, let's read. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun was risen. And they were saying among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the tomb? And looking up, they see that the stone is rolled back 
for it was exceeding great. And entering into the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, arrayed in a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said unto them, Be not amazed, ye seek Jesus the Nazarene, who had been crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter, he goes before you into Galilee, and there shall you see him, as he said unto you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had come upon them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Well, that's Mark's account of the coming of these women to the tomb early upon the first day of the week, concerned about, as they should have been normally, how... <laughs> How are we going to get that huge stone rolled away? I want to share just a bit of a personal experience of my, without any braggadocious, it's just a humble experience of a, a Bible student. In 1986, I had the opportunity to be with Farrell Jenkins at this site, at a tomb. Archaeologists say it was like this. It was a tomb that was carved out of the interior, <laughs> carved out of stone. It had within it a couch that was a part of the carving, a part of the one-piece stone uh, cave where a body was laid. And they allowed two of us. Myself and my travel mate at that time was one of the elders of the church in Eugene, Oregon, Coburg Road. Clyde Johnston. He and I went in and we stood there. And I'm not showing you this any thought whatsoever that this makes me any different, any better, other than it made me a better Bible student. And a lot of things can make you a better Bible student. But to stand there and on the right see that couch where perhaps, if not exactly this place, one like it somewhere here outside the walls of the old city of Jerusalem is where we were, it was breathless to think of what might have happened on that very spot, if not here, somewhere. And it made such an indelible impression. I trust that I never will forget, but my faith is still based upon Scripture. But the Scripture is more real and more alive because it tells the truth of what happened. But that stone, they, they, the preparation of these tombs was um, an opening, of course, that could be entered and exited, five to six feet. But the stone was, I remember as a younger person thinking, trying to picture a big boulder being rolled up <laughs> against that door. But that's not what they did. They had a huge wheel like stone that set in a groove on the front of that tomb. A groove was setting there, and it was just simply that wheel would be rolled back and forth to close and to open that tomb. But it was huge, it was heavy, but it could be done, and it was done. But that's what these women were concerned about as they approached. So what they found was this evidence. He's not there. Christ's body was no longer present in the tomb. Now, people who want to express their agnostic or atheistic positions on this was, aha, it was stolen. But that theory was suggested in the very first century. Measures had been taken to avoid any possibility of that even being thought because the Roman soldiers sealed, but when the Roman soldiers came to the Jews and said, it's gone, the body is gone, it's not there. They bribed the soldiers. Remember at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, read that if you haven't read that in a while, how the, sol the, the Jewish leaders bribed the soldiers. We'll pay you large sums of money if you'll go out and say, someone stole the body. 
So the only way that theory ever got started was through bribery of the Jewish people who put him to death. We've got to say something or we're going to look bad if he's not, if he, if he's not there. So the absence of the body, he's not there, becomes undeniable evidence when explained by the angel. What the angel simply said, this was an angel from God. He says, simply said, there's where he was on that couch on the right where I was sitting. He is not there because he is risen. That verification by a messenger of God again becomes a part of the undeniable evidence. Let's look at John 20 for just one more consideration of the tomb. In John chapter 20, we come to the end of the Gospel of John that the Apostle John, uh, one of the apostles here, uh, was writing as an eyewitness. And in the first four verses of this chapter, which we don't have listed on the chart, it is when Mary Magdalene came and told them that we were at the tomb and Jesus was not there. We're concerned what happened. We don't know what happened. So she told Peter, and the other disciple is the way that John identifies himself, but the other disciple whom Jesus loved in verse 2. So when they heard this, it, this is an interesting and human drama in New Testament Scripture. These two apostles were so struck by this news that they both started running. They both started running toward the tomb. And verse 3, verse 4, they ran both together. They were together. And the other disciple outran Peter. In other words, John tells us about himself. I outran Peter to get there, which is an interesting human drama of this. So John arrives first outrunning Peter. But look what Peter does when he gets there. And came to the, uh, outran Peter and came first to the tomb, verse 5, and stooping and looking in, he seeth the linen cloth lying, yet entered he not in. So John was hesitant. He got there, he stooped and looked. It was dark, but he didn't go in. Verse 6, Simon Peter therefore also cometh, following him and entered into the tomb, he bounded into the tomb and he beholdeth the linen cloth lying. And the napkin that was upon his head and lying with the linen cloths but rolled up in a place by itself. Then entered in therefore the other disciple, John followed him into the inside of the tomb who came first to the tomb and he saw and believed. I want us to try to wrap our minds around what is happening here with Peter and John. This is such an important event. We perhaps have read this many, many times. You have. But it becomes an incontrovertible, undeniable evidence. And what is seen here that becomes an evidence is what we refer to as the grave clothes. Just in the end of chapter 19, Jer Joseph of Arimathea, which we could say a lot about, asked permission to take the body of Jesus down. He had courage, and it, it took courage for him to go into Pilate in the face of all of this political, Jewish prejudice and presence to ask for the body of Jesus. He did. Well, a lot could be said about that. But Pilate granted him permission. Joseph of Arimathea went and took the body down from the cross. And he wrapped it in a linen cloth and took it to his own tomb that had been hewn out of stone that no one had ever used. No dead 
body had ever been placed in that tomb, which in itself becomes very important. There's no mistakes here. There's no misidentification here. For no one had ever been buried in that tomb. But we're affirming that the grave clothes prove the reality and nature of the resurrection. Their presence and orderly arrangement produced faith. Now, what did that we, we talk about the empty tomb, and of course, what we mean by that is no body. But literally, the tomb was not literally empty because it still had the grave clothes. Now, we notice what the scripture says. And he beholdeth the linen cloths lying. They were just lying randomly. But let's take a little closer notice of the napkin that had been on his head. Was it strewn or thrown? Or if, it had, if the body had been stolen, it would have been gone. <laughs> It's still there, but it's not just thrown haphazardly. It was rolled up, folded up in a place by itself. In other words, a very neatly folded head cloth. This head napkin had been folded neatly and placed by itself. Now, who did that? it becomes an incontrovertible evidence when you look at the clothes that were a part of the burial still there and how they had been placed with very careful, careful placement. So in John chapter 20 and verse eight, what we said is true. Then entered in therefore the other disciple also who came first to the tomb, John entered and he saw and believed. He saw this, what, we're, what you and I are seeing through the eye of our faith. He saw this with his own eye. He was an eyewitness of this. He was there. And what he saw caused him to believe. And he's writing this at the end of the first century. One more. This is a third area of evidence I'd like for you to take note of in your mind so that you know that your faith in this bodily resurrection is grounded on solid rock of the prophecy of Jesus, what he said would happen, it happened. The tomb and the evidence that it presented. And finally, his own personal verification. Now let me preface that with saying this. If you and I, in this day and age, had someone come to us and claim there had been a resurrection from the dead, okay, our desire would be for them to prove it, okay? Just prove it. If it, the death had been certified, it had been known for sure this person was dead and buried, and there could have been no more certainty than the death and burial of Jesus to certify his death. He was dead. Then for that person that they're claiming to have been raised from the dead today, if they come in here, we'll just have, have him walk in so that we, we can see him living and walking and talking. We'll believe you. That's all you have to do. Just have them give us a personal verification. This person who was dead is now alive. I'm said, saying that to suggest to us this is exactly what happened with Jesus. In Luke chapter 24, as we look at these passages, beginning at verse 36, You will recognize the bulk of Luke 24. It records the event of the resurrection, but Jesus walking with the two from Emmaus, talking with them, going to their house. 
He went to their house, and when he sat down in verse 30 with them to a meal, he took bread and blessed and breaking it, gave to them. And so they, that's at that point when they recognized him. So let's begin in verse 33. They rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And they rehearsed the things that happened in the way and how he was known of them in the breaking of bread. These are the two disciples from Emmaus now had made a quick trip from Emmaus to Jerusalem, had gone into where they knew the apostles were, and others, there was a crowd gathered. And this is what they said. Now verse 36, as they spake these things, he himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, peace be unto you. But they were terrified and frightened and suppose that they beheld a spirit. Now, just note of that. Remember what we saw on that affirmation from um, that first source in the earlier chart, affirming that what was resurrected was an invisible spirit creature? Well, that's what the apostles thought they were seeing. They thought they were seeing, and you and I would say, a ghost, a spirit that had all of a sudden become visible. That's what they thought. Well, let's see what happens. Verse 38. And he said unto them, that's Jesus, Why are you troubled? Wherefore do questionings arise in your heart? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you behold me having. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have you here anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broad fish. And he took it and ate it before them. So let's just make a couple of obvious observations from this passage. Jesus invited the disciples in this room on this occasion. This was on the evening of the same day that he was resurrected to see and touch his body. That in itself. But he had hands, he had feet, he had flesh and bones. And he simply said to them, you ought to know better. A, a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see me having. So what he spoke here by this personal verification, it's true. The body that you see standing before you is the body that was resurrected from the tomb. But he took a step further. He said, I'm, I'm hungry. Do you have anything to eat? And they had a piece of broiled fish, so they served him fish. And in their sight, he ate that fish. Now, what does that indicate to you? Purposely to prove a thing, I'm just reading what, so we all together thinking the same thoughts here. To prove a living physical body with normal biological processes. He needed food. He could ingest, he could digest. And the point of that is, <laughs> hey, I'm just the physical body that you see standing before you. I'm not merely a ghost, some invisible spirit creature. You can see me, you can touch me, and you can watch me eat. But I have one more thought. And that is in John 20. And probably if I ask most of you, you probably remember this event. Sometimes we talk about doubting Thomas. And I have commented on that before. I personally don't use that expression. And I don't fault those who do. But I don't see Thomas as primarily as doubting. 
I see him as from a, a science point of view. Hey, I need verification here for myself. You're telling me, okay, I can believe what you said, but I need to see for myself. I need verification for me. So it took a week. A week later is this event. In John chapter 20 and verse 19, let's begin reading at verse 26. After eight days, that is after that first meeting that we just referred to, again his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Thomas was here this time. Jesus cometh the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger and see my hands. Reach hither thy hand and put it into my side and be not faithless but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. That's the capstone of the gospel of the Apostle John. That's what John has been writing from the very first verse to accomplish in everybody, including you, so that we see Jesus and we say unto Jesus, my Lord and my God. And that is seen in Thomas. But Thomas validated the body of Jesus to be the same one that was crucified. Jesus, how did he put that? Make sure that we don't misrepresent. Jesus simply said, Thomas, take your finger and, and touch my hand. You can still touch that nail print there. It's still there. The wound is still present. You can feel it. Or take your hand and, and put it into my side. It's still there. The wound is still there. You can feel it. <laughs> and that's exactly what Thomas did. And he had what you and I would call empirical evidence. You go into a science lab and you do an experiment to prove something. What you're wanting is not what, what someone said. You want what you can see as evidence in front of you. And that's what Thomas had and has been presented to us, empirical evidence. He touched the nail print. His hand was in the spear wound on his side. And instead of saying, I'm, I, I'm still doubting, <laughs> I'm still uncertain. No, Thomas simply said, my Lord and my God. And so he, he affirmed that this was the body, this is the same body that was born in Bethlehem, same one, that grew up in Nazareth with a family, siblings, brothers and sisters that Joseph and Mary had after he was born by the Vir Virgin Mary. Went the same body at the age of 30 that he walked from Nazareth to the River Jordan to be baptized of John the Baptist, same body. The same body that walked Judea and Galilee and Perea and taught and worked so many miracles for three and a half years, the same body. And it was the same body that was laid on that cross on the ground. And those Roman soldiers drove those nails through his hands and through his feet, exactly the same body. It was the same body that Joseph of Arimathea took down and placed in the tomb the same body. It came out alive. And I heard in Mike's prayer this morning acknowledging that Christ is living today, seated today at the right hand of God. He is alive today because of this. And this affirms what we have been quoting as written in verse 27 and 28. Believing, Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. So we want to go back to where we started and just remind us of what we have been trying to accomplish in as short amount of time as we can. Evidences upon which your faith can be built. I don't know how anyone, uh, 
It has been said, and I've read it more than one place, that the resurrection of Christ is the most proven event that ever occurred on this planet. And you and I can prove a lot of other events. We take the word of history, we take the word of historians, but the resurrection of Christ is the most proven of everything that's ever happened on this globe. And for anyone to doubt or to ever question or try to change the scripture is an act of total futility. Let's believe, let's have a strong faith because the importance is seen in its relationship to Christ's identity. He was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. It's important to its relationship to your salvation. Paul said in this passage, if Christ was not raised, you remember? Your faith is in vain. It's worthless. You are still guilty of your sins. Now think what that would mean right now. If Christ had not been raised, if what we have just seen in these scriptures was not true, then every sin that you've ever committed, even though you've been baptized, is still on you. Guilt, consequences, punishment, if Christ has not been raised. But he has been. And its meaning to your salvation makes it all a living hope. And then finally, our resurrection will occur in its own order. Christ the first fruits and then those that are Christ. The fact that you one day will be, now let me word this carefully, bodily resurrected into a spiritual body, a sophisticated spiritual body, I call it, that will be given you, that will be formed after the body of Jesus Christ so you can spend eternity in heaven with him. That's the bodily resurrection that is in store for every faithful disciple of Christ. And it's possible because of the bodily resurrection of Christ. Good. We trust that we have profited and benefited. And let's believe and study and learn the doc, not only on a day that must be close to the approximate time that it happened back in the first century, not in any time of holy day celebration, but on something that we do each and every first day of the week. <laughs> we come together upon this first day of the week, especially to appreciate him, to appreciate his death, and to appreciate his resurrection. If you're here today and subject to the invitation, we want you to be welcome to come, ask us to help you, or let us know how we might in the future, as together we stand and sing.